thank you for that. Today, we're starting a new series on 1 Timothy called The Good Fight. If you've never read the book of 1 Timothy, it's fairly short, easy one to read. I would encourage you, read the whole book so you can get the whole plan. But today, I'm going to talk about some reminders. And, um, you know, one of the neat things that happened to me this week as I was thinking about this book is... Um, my mentor, one of my mentors, Dave Daniel, died about 15 years ago now, and uh, at least 10. And um, uh, his daughter, uh, I was teaching Bible study last week uh, on Thursday, and all of a sudden I saw his daughter show up, and, and she came to me and she said, Hey, Eric, would you like some of my dad's books? And I said, Yeah. And so she brought the books, and um, I started going through them, and I didn't realize what it would do to me. Number one, it was very kind of emotional for me because it kind of was a connection to him. I have no idea what this book is about, by the way. No idea. But as I opened this book and just looked, I saw where he underlined what was important to him. And as somebody who really respected Dave, I look at this book and I think, oh, what mattered to him? Maybe that should matter to me. Dave was very analytical. He must have not only liked to have this book. The secret is to find the balance between caring enough to give it your bearing, excuse me, to give it your very best, but not carrying the emotional responsibility of every person. I mean, I was just looking at just dis different various quotes in this book that he underlined, things that he thought were important, things that mattered, that mattered to me. See, Timothy considered himself as one of Paul's spiritual children. And when he talked about Paul, and when he was raised by Paul, and when Paul took him on missions with him, and when Paul now was encouraging him, now that he was a pastor in his early 20s, Paul was encouraging Timothy. And he wrote this book that we're going to be reading. And I'm sure when Timothy first read this letter, he saw everything and said, wow, look at him just pouring his life out. But Paul also knew that this letter would not just be read by Timothy. He knew it would be read by the early church. And so the, the things in there are not just for Timothy. And the things in there, even though they're called pastoral epistles, you know, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus are called the pastoral epistles. And the problem with the pastor letters is we think, well, that's not for us. But that's not true. Because as we read these, not only do we learn about the structure of the church, we also learn practical truths that we often forget. And so today I want to talk about these things that we forget. And I want to give you three faith reminders. Today we're talking about our, our subject is holding to the faith. Did you know over 20 people fall off cruise ships every year? Every year. All you got to do is stay on the ship. Now I know some probably do it on purpose. I get it. I, you know, somebody's going to say, well, some do it on purpose. But some don't. Somebody's walking and walks off the ship. They just, ah! And all they got to do is stay on. Can I tell you something about faith? Paul talks about it at the end of this chapter that some people have shipwrecked their faith. And here's why. Because they don't hold on. God can handle so many things. But the truth is, sometimes we get caught up in things that don't matter and things that aren't important. And that's what Paul is dealing with. Because here's what I want you to know. Satan wants nothing more than for you to be discouraged or destroyed. Because if you get discouraged enough, you won't want to focus on what God has for you. You'll focus, by the way, many times, you know what discouragement focuses on? Ourselves. If we're not careful, discouragement is not just about the events that are happening, not just about the things that are going on with us. The truth is sometimes and oftentimes discouragement is because we start to look inward at ourselves and it's very hard to get your eyes on Jesus when you're so busy being discouraged about something in your life. It's normal, but it's what the enemy uses to keep you from looking up. Because his whole goal is for you to shipwreck. For you to destroy not only your life, but the lives of the people around you. And so today as I look at these three things that we're going to talk about, I want you to know that these are three things that if you'll apply them to your life and recognize them in your life, they will help you on those days. Listen, we all get discouraged. How many of you have had a, day, a time of discouragement this week? 
at some point this week. Okay, look around. See, you're not crazy. How many of you just lied and you didn't raise your hand? Okay, so... so <laughs> oh, that extra hour of sleep did not happen. Now, let's start. Number one. Remember... The goal is to volunteer to help with the donuts. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not. Remember the goal to love. We get caught up in so many external things. We get, we get so busy trying to get laundry done. We get so busy trying to get a kid from here to there. We get so busy trying to get from here to work and then deal with that person. Do you know that person? Don't point at them if they're in the room. Maybe it's dealing with our spouse. We get so focused on that that we forget the goal is not to fix that or to deal with that or to accomplish this list of things. Our goal is to love. Listen to what Paul says. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so you can command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Let me just give you a background on this. I was trying to Americanize this, so I thought of, what is this like if Jewish people were comparing genealogies and talking about, basically they were saying, my daddy can beat up your daddy. My ancestor is better than your ancestor. I remember years ago, my dad saying to me, I said to him one day, I said, dad, what is our genealogy? What's our background? He goes, we don't want to know. <laughs> this is a very country answer, by the way. Anybody who's a hillbilly like me, that's just a normal answer. My family's from Milledgeville, Georgia. Before that, Ireland. And none of them wanted to know who their ancestors were. So I joked with my dad. I said, why, why don't we want to know? Is something wrong? He goes, oh, probably moonshine runners. Well, what I didn't know and found out later, it wasn't probably. It was yes. Not only a moonshine runner, but a sheriff that was a moonshine runner and killed somebody when they caught him with the moonshine and took off. Woohoo! My genealogy is better than yours, right? So, you know, if you're a hillbilly, you're like, genealogy, we don't want to know that. Don't look back. A new day's breaking. Just keep going, right? So, so you don't want to look back. So Paul, in the early church, there were people fighting over who had the better genealogy. Just a dumb thing to our... And as Americans, we're like, yeah, who cares about genealogy? But it was a big deal to them. By the way, you argue about other things that don't matter. They used to argue about how many angels could dance on the end of a pen. Some of you are arguing over lyrics to a song. Here we go. Such things provoke controversial speculations, which basically means you're wasting your time, rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is what? Love. love. Very good. So much better than last night when I asked that. When I said last night, I think one person said love, and I said, let's go home. <laughs> and listen to this, which comes from, I love this, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. This word for sincere faith means the opposite of hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy in English, we know what that means. But to Greeks, hypocrisy mean, meant to put on a mask because it meant an actor. It was somebody who put on a mask. And so Paul says one of the ways that this happens is when we quit putting on masks and we're off, uh, honest with each other, when you're vulnerable with each other. And Paul's going to be vulnerable here in just a minute. He's going to be the example of vulnerability to us as Christians. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. Do you know anybody who talks too much? Do you have a relative that you have to do the hanging up? Do you do the country thing where you say, I'm going to let you go. And what you mean is, you're going to let me go. But you say, I'm going to let you go now. Which means, let me go now. You have anybody like that? By the way, if you don't have anybody in your life like that, it's you. Somebody's on the phone with you going, I'm going to let you go now. All right, keep going. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. Don't you love that? Isn't that awesome? Paul just calls somebody out like, you want to teach, but you don't even know what you're talking about. It's like watching Sports Center. <laughs> or, sorry, or what they so confidently affirm. So they're confident. By the way, people tend to follow confident people. I, I saw this 
health expert online today. The guy was super confident. He literally just made stuff up. I want to release a video just making stuff up. I'm just going to make stuff up. Peanuts are bad for you. Why? Because of Mr. Peanut. You know, whatever. Just make stuff up. But if you're confident about it, people are like, oh, what they said must be true. Oh, and that was happening here in the first... And Paul is saying, hey, if they're talking about things that don't matter, if they're talking about things that don't lead to anything, if they love to talk about things that are way out here and you can't do anything about them, it's meaningless. And the truth is, we, we today have way too much access to meaningless talk. I, I love that you watch the news. I, I want you to be up on what's happening in the world. But you were not designed to handle all of the world's problems. That's Jesus' job. And I know you want to fix them. I know you want to fix all of them. So you watch every news channel, trying to find out how many problems there are. So you can think about all of them all day long. Kristen and I watched a show about alien invasion. I wanted to build a bunker. <laughs> right? And, and so some of you are almost that way. You've watched so much news and you're hearing about all the problems in the world that you're like, i got to fix this. But is it meaningless? Do things that matter. Look for those opportunities. And, and here's the deal. Listen. This is a, 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 a tester. It tests its voltage, amperage, and resistance. Did I get all it all right? It's a multimeter. Is there anything else that the experts want to tell me that I need to tell everybody? Now, I never use this hardly. I mean, I think I've used it one time. You know why? Because I hand it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Because I've been shocked before. I know that you're surprised by that. Okay, I've been shocked many times. I know you're... I've been shocked so many times that somebody from church brought me a tool that I can wave near things that might have power so that I would know, don't touch that. It might have power. So I have this little brown stick that I go, okay, I'm not touching that. Beep, 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 beep. Don't touch that. That's how bad it is. But here's the thing about all of us. Have you looked at your life if you're a believer, have you noticed, are you more loving this year than you were last year? Or are you more anxious? Are you more frustrated? Do you argue more now than you used to argue? A little voltage meter for you. Let me, let me see what's really going on. Look at your conversations. Look at your thought life. I woke up this morning, I immediately wanted to complain. And, I, and I've complained a few times today. I've tried not to. But this is not my favorite time change, okay? I'll just be honest with you. I like late night. I like light. I like to walk the dog. I don't like this. So I want to complain about it. I want to tell you everything that's wrong. And yet, you can complain or be thankful, but you can't do both at the same time. And when you're complaining and negative, what begins to happen is you begin to notice everything that's wrong. Your love begins to go away. It's hard to love other people when you're grumpy. Have you noticed that? Paul then goes on. He talks about all kinds of sins. And the reason he talks about all kinds of sins is because the truth for all of us in these next passages is that when we begin to pursue sin and selfishness, it's very hard to be loving. I love what it says in Romans 12. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Now, it doesn't say hate who is evil. It says hate what is evil. Cling to what's good. Be devoted to one another in love. And then it says honor one another above yourselves. So that means you consider the perspectives of other people. You look at what the people around you need. You look at what the people... But you ready for this one? This one's hard. This is, if you're an ADD person, this, I'm going to say the worst word you've ever heard. You ready? You have to listen to other people. ADD people, that's hard because I'm listening to somebody. Right? I mean, I'm listening and I'm answering. 
while I'm listening, right? And so I'm not really listening. And you have to not only listen to what people are saying, you have to listen to what they're saying. Did you hear me? Honor one another. You know, I was thinking, what does it mean to honor one another? I was thinking this morning, I heard Charles Stanley a little bit this morning, and he was friends with Peter Lord. I remember going to Park Avenue early in the morning, and all of a sudden, the pastor of Park Avenue, who had a multi-million dollar budget at that time, comes walking out of the bathroom with a brush and a cleaning set, and he's headed to the next bathroom. He would go in early in the morning and clean all the bathrooms because he just wanted to serve and honor other people. He was a pastor of the church, but he saw himself as a servant, and he wanted to do what he could to serve other people. What does that look like at your house? What does that look like at your workplace? One of the things I know about Charles Stanley is around Christmas time, every year he would go and help with the different ministries, whether they were doing a mailer, and he would help for a little while. Not because he had to. He, they paid all kind of people. But because he wanted to. Who are you serving and honoring in your life? Number two, remember God's mercy on you. You ever forget what your purpose is? You ever forget how God blessed you? There's a story about a man who lost his job, and uh, he didn't know what to do, so he finally decided, you know what, I'm just going to the zoo today. So he goes to the zoo, and while he's there, he sees one of the zookeepers, and he goes, you guys got any jobs open? And the guy said, you're not going to believe this. One of our gorillas died last night. But there's a bunch of kids coming for a tour. Could you put on the gorilla outfit and act like the gorilla? The guy says, absolutely. So he puts on the gorilla outfit, goes there. The kids come, and he decides he's going to ham it up a little bit. So he's playing like the gorilla. He gets on the gorilla swing. When he gets on the gorilla swing, gets a little too excited, swings into the lion cage. Right. Once he swings into the lion cage, he starts screaming, Oh, no, no, somebody help me. The lion's approaching him. He's like, oh, no, somebody help me. The lion gets a little closer, and all of a sudden he hears the lion say, be quiet or you're going to make us lose both our jobs. <laughs> I always like a new joke. So here's the truth. You ever forget how you've been changed? You ever forget what God did for you because you've gotten used to it? You ever forget what really matters in life? Paul talks about that next. There's lots of fakers. Here, here's what he talks about. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who's given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. And then listen to what Paul says, talking about being vulnerable. Listen to this. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Anybody relate to that? I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And I love this word because it literally means the best. But it would make no sense to translate it that way. But it's like Paul saying, I'm the best sinner. That's what he literally is saying here. He's like, you know what? All the sinners, you guys are amateurs. I'm a professional sinner. And so Paul says, God came to save me and I'm the worst of sinners. And then he continues, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. Do you realize the patience he has with you? As an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, and then he gets excited. Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, I know who I am. And it helps me relate to other people. It helps me to show what God has done for me. You ever meet somebody who's angry all the time? Do you, do you have a relative who's just angry all the time? They're just angry all the time. They... they no matter what, they're just on edge. You have to be on eggshells around them. They, they, they look at everybody else and nobody ever measures up. And they're always evaluating everybody else all the time. And after a while, it just wears on you. It's exhausting to be around them. You know why they get that way? Because they don't recognize the grace that's been poured out on them. Do you know when I'm the most gracious driver? After I do something dumb. 
Now, I know you all think I'm the best driver in the world. I've heard you say it. Thank you. Thank you. But believe it or not, Brian, believe it or not, I have made mistakes while driving. I remember one day very specifically, the left turn arrow turned left, and I thought that the green light also came on, so I went. And I had people honking at me, and I did the apologetic wave. You ever do the apologetic wave? Sorry. It was amazing how gracious I was. I didn't honk at anybody that day. People stayed at lights forever, and I was like, better than me today. But then we forget, and suddenly we're the best driver in the world, and all these idiots come out on the road, right? Isn't it amazing when we recognize the grace that God's given us, how much more loving we are with other people? In Mark 5, Jesus did not let him. This is a guy who was healed. He said, go to your own people, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Let me give you a Charles Stanley quote. A Christian has no right being in a fight unless it's a spiritual fight. And let's talk about that. Number three, remember that you're in a faith battle. You ever, for, you ever been on an airplane and forget you're on an airplane? You go to sleep on the airplane and you, you just totally forget you're... And then all of a sudden there's turbulence and you suddenly remember you're on an airplane. And if you're like me, you look at the stewardess and you're like, is she scared? I was on a flight one day where she was scared. And she ran and got in the, the thing and I saw her face like, oh my gosh, we're all going to die. And then I thought, we're all going to die, right? Too many times in life we get comfortable and we think that we're just going through life and maybe we have a problem with this person. And then when life gets really hard, suddenly we wake up and realize we're in a spiritual battle. Can I encourage you to be aware of that every day, all the time? Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that recalling them, you may fight the battle well. That means to have strategy. It's a literally the word for strategy. Holding on to the faith and a good conscience which some have rejected. And so they've suffered shipwreck. Remember I told you what the enemy wanted to do. He wants you to shipwreck. He wants you to be so discouraged you can't do anything. With regard to the faith. And then he names some people. The enemy wants you to quit. The enemy especially wants you to quit the good things that you do. I promise you, if you get involved in helping or doing something to bless someone, the enemy will come in and say, you need to quit. And you'll be tempted to quit all the time. Because the enemy would rather you be selfish and self-centered and only care about you. But the ultimate joy happens when we do what God called us to do. We recognize that we're in a battle and we win the battle. When we see it through and we say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says this. This is the last book he wrote. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. See, Satan doesn't want to do anything to you except destroy you or at least distract you. Yesterday, I got a call about a potential ministry. And as I talked to Rudy about this ministry, he was telling me about a, a coach that started to despair and he thought he wasn't making a difference, and he thought he didn't matter, and he had PTSD, and he ended up committing suicide. And Rudy said, I went to the funeral, and over a thousand people showed up, each of them saying how this guy had mattered in their life. And then Rudy said, this potential new ministry is starting because of the vision of this guy. This guy had no idea how God was using him. And can I tell you something? If you're discouraged today, if you feel like you don't matter, if you're ready to give up, can I tell you something? You matter. You're making a difference. Every day that you're here, you're a blessing to someone. Recognize that the battle is not just physical. It is. It's not just emotional, although it is. But it's also spiritual. The enemy wants you to quit. But keep fighting. Keep going. Keep pressing on. Don't stop. Love the people around you. Go out of your way to not argue about things, but look for opportunities to make a difference in the world and in people's lives.
you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. That's the first step to winning the battle is to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Then the ultimate victory is won, even if you blow it and mess up <laughs> so many days. But that's the beginning, and God will give you strength to overcome. So if you want to talk after the service or if you're watching online, you want to talk about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to Christ, knowing that he died and rose again to pay for your sins. If you're here today and you're struggling, maybe the enemy's been after you and you know it, and as I'm talking today, you're like, wow, that one's me. Just be honest with God about it. Recognize you're not in here by yourself. We're here to help you, to encourage you, to bless you on this journey. You don't have to do it alone. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Lord, I thank you for the example that Paul was, not only to Timothy, but to each of us, that, Father, we recognize the grace you've poured into our lives, and we pray that we would be graceful to other people, that we would show them your love and show them what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for your grace. We all need it. Lord, bless each one, especially those who are hurting today, those who are fighting a battle that none of us can see. I pray they would know your strength today. In Jesus' name, amen.